I'm originally trained as an electronics designer. Uh, and in 1981, I had the uh, privilege of landing a job at the university developing a TMJ uh, research facility up, up in dentistry. Believe it or not, that's how I got into this. And in 1981, I developed my first uh, uh, neurostimulator, uh, mostly for stimulating trigeminal nerve for relaxing the jaw, and, and then we started using it on the back and different muscles and so on. And that's how I kind of got into this whole thing. And as we know, everything uh, what we're doing here is all about balancing arousal. The brain has a tendency to have either too much gas or no brakes. Either which way is often disastrous. And this technology, uh, I really have come to believe in using it a lot for adjusting the gas or adjusting the brakes, as you would with neurofeedback or other techniques as well. I'm going to talk to you about audiovisual entrainment first. Audiovisual entrainment was actually first discovered in 1934 when Adrian and Matthews <coughs> discovered that you could drive brain waves, alpha waves actually, above and, beyond, above and below their natural resonant frequency uh, with flashing lights. And in all through the 30s and 40s, there were dozens and dozens of studies done on flashing lights in the eyes and seeing what brain waves would do and all this kind of stuff. But no one, looked, no one linked the subjective effects of blinking lights and pulsing tones uh, until actually 1955 when W. Gray Walters published probably the seminal study on about 10,000 different subjects, all about the visual hallucinations they had, the experiences, how they felt, uh, all these different things at different frequencies, different waveforms, and so on. But some of the interesting stuff, though, that really spawned out of this was this machine here which was released in 1958 called the Brainwave Synchronizer. And it was a good piece of Frankenstonian kind of lab gear. You could unscrew this front panel here. It has a delta and alpha beta range. You could unscrew it and put your, your clients in one room and you're in the other room turning the little dials and having them feel all, you know, nervous. Uh, and this was a spin-off from uh, William Kroger's work. William Kroger was a physician with the U.S. military and it was his job to find out how come on a battleship, this is the Second World War, by the way, how come on the battleship or on a bomber plane, they completely drove into enemy territory and suddenly the enemy shooting bullets and bombs at them from all directions and they should have seen it 20, 30 minutes ago on the radar, except that the radar guy was in a trance. And those old flash and blip type radars with a little blinky light was trancing these, these guys out. And he then linked that with the, with the photic driving technique that had been discovered by Adrian and Matthews and teamed up with Sidney Schneider of the Schneider Instrument Company in Illinois and said, well, let's build a machine and we can actually put people in states of hypnotic induction. And that was in 1958. And that's how it, this whole thing spawned sort of on a, from a commercial level. And they did a number of studies in dentistry using hypnotic induction. They did uh, gastrointestinal uh, stimulation to reduce anesthesia, because in the old days, anesthesia was risky for major surgery. And, uh, and that's where it all came. I got on board with this audiovisual stuff in 1984 when I was asked to design a machine to help performing art students overcome stage fright. And that's how I got in. And over the years, I've designed all kinds of gear. You can see some of this stuff. There. This is the first one I did, the big one. <clears throat> it was called the David One. Uh, uh, my name was David. I changed my name to Dave after because uh, everybody said, oh, David, eh? you must been, feel pretty important about yourself. Um, but really what happened is, is that the, the fellow I originally designed it for, he changed his mind about 15 times because he really didn't know what he wanted, uh, the instructor in performing arts. So by the time it was all done, he owed me a fair chunk of money. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so he said, well, I, I can't afford to pay you, but I will name it in such a way that you'll feel honored. <laughs> and I was thinking Neurostim was what I wanted to call it, or Hemisync, or something like that. Anyway, he comes back with David, and I go, oh, geez, I could have thought of that, you know, just can, can I have, just give me some money. And he said, well, no, digital audio visual integration device. We're integrating brain waves with visual audio, digital audio visual stimulation. And I thought, well, he's not paying me anyway, and he put some thought into it, so I guess what the heck, we'll put the name on the faceplate. And when you silk screen stuff like this, you know, the first one costs $1,500. But in 
but you can run 100 of them for $1,800. <laughs> so of course we ran off 100, which was good because I destroyed the first five trying to make the machine. And, uh, and then the name kind of caught on and, uh, and Omni did an article on it, some other magazines did articles on it and it kind of became a bit of a household name so we figured we'd better just leave it be. So yes, now everything is called, these are all called Davids now. Anyway, audiovisual stimulation is all about the, hype, the whole, whole about the thalamus. All of our senses except smell are routed through the thalamus. And the thalamus, as you know, is distributed throughout the entire cortex. There's fibers running both ways, and that's what gives us our alpha rhythm. It's a cortical thalamic loop. When we have nothing to do and we close our eyes, the, the, the cortex says, hey, how's it going? And the thalamus says, hey, I'm all right. How are you doing? Hey, I'm okay. How are you doing? Well, I'm okay. How are you doing? And you, you got about two inches or so of space, and it takes 100 milliseconds, roughly, for that little loop to oscillate back and forth, which is 10 hertz. And we interrupt that with stimulation. And that's the whole idea. If you pulse tones into the ears, bump, 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 sounds, you get into the thalamus through the medial geniculate, and you start exciting the cortex with sound. And here's an example. If this is an oscilloscope tracing of that, it'd be as it traced across, <clears throat> and you'd see about 10 milliseconds later, there's this big on pulse in the auditory cortex from the excitation of the tone burst coming down the pipe. This is the world's biggest entrainment device, <laughs> and costs billions of dollars, and they're only made by the Department of Highways. And um, at about 60 miles an hour, or 100 kilometers an hour, those of you who are from Canada or other places outside the US. These typically go by at about six lines per second, and I've measured it in several countries. However, I was on the Autobahn once doing about 200 kilometers an hour, and they went by much quicker, and I did not get drowsy. Uh, so if it's at nighttime, and of course, so you have a good, you know, bright, dark contrast, and you're usually a little sleepy anyway, these can pull you into a theta state and you can hallucinate and see a pink elephant, which might be a little giggly, or have a severe shock and see your, your mother-in-law on the highway, and suddenly, you know, talk about a flight or fight response in the middle of the night, suddenly you wake up, anyway, and then now you're just on 18 cups of coffee after that experience. Uh, but basically, yes, you can get entrained off the highway, and it's called highway hypnosis. If you condense that down, so anyway, so I'll get to that. So it's flashing lights in the eyes, runs down to the optic nerve, end of the thalami via the lateral geniculate, and, and also fibers go back into the occipital cortex, and the rest goes into the neocortex and causes, of course, your rhythm to happen. Does that make sense so far? Cool. Okay, here's an example of Kinney's study in 1973 showing just that. The x-axis is one second across, and here they are flashing at two flashes per second. Now, we saw here that there's a 100 millisecond delay from the flash onset to the actual peak of the pulse back there, which, uh, by the way, correlates with 10 hertz, natural alpha. We entrain best at natural alpha, although you can push people above and beyond, but you get your best results there. So here's at two flashes per second. Here's a flash right here. Here's the evoked response. At the half second mark, there's another flash, and here's the evoked response. These are just visual evoked responses. There's nothing significant or wonderful or amazing about that. Uh, but when you're flashing at four, flash, response, flash, response, flash, response, flash, response. Look at this now. If you put this on a spectral analysis, you'd see there's a four hertz riding wave in there. There's some harmonics in this, partly because they're using a square wave. They're using a strobe light, which makes harmonics. Uh, look at eight, quite a nice waveform. Look at 12, very, very nice. And here is 20 here. So you can instantly drive the brain into a state very quickly, within seconds in some cases. This is an EEG um, showing the distribution at roughly 8 hertz. And you can see the distribution is very broad, central, frontal, and parietal. And even prefrontal is very, very hot. It's almost maxed. And in this case, we were using a, a we're not using a, a sine wave, but we're using a modified square wave, which makes a second harmonic, and it shows up at 16. And we often use this type of waveform for enhancing cognition. Uh, but for meditation or relaxation, we use a pure sine wave because other waveforms generate harmonics. 
you don't want harmonics in the beta range when you're trying to meditate somebody. So we use sine waves for 10 hertz and under typically. Okay, <clears throat> this was uh, Frederick and Lou. He was uh, a grad student of Lubar, and he did this study a few years back. And that they just used 18 and a half hertz off of the stimulator, and they measured it at the vertex. And they found that entrainment, eyes closed, photic entrainment increased EEG by about 49%, which is pretty significant. Eyes closed, auditory entrainment increased EEG activity by about 21%. So it's about two and a half fold in terms of the power of the lights over the audio. But here is one of the really fascinating things about entrainment that was missed <clears throat> for about 70 or so years is that entrainment inhibits the half frequency of stimulation. I discovered this about 10 years ago or so, and, uh, and not long after, so did Tom Kalura. And this is uh, with BrainMaster, and Tom is using photic stim that's derived from an EEG in this case. So what he's doing, this, this child has a lot of 7 hertz theta ADHD, right? So at the, roughly the 30 minute mark, he decided to inject 14 hertz flashing lights at 14 based on the double of the brainwave, the dominant brainwave. And as a result, within moments, inhibited all that theta. Very fast, very powerful. And we've been doing that for the longest time. We have, we have oh, several years ago, I think it was around 1999, we did a study on seasonal affective disorder. And people suffering from SAD make long, long trains of 10 hertz alpha. It doesn't really spindle. Well, their spindles are 10 seconds long. And it's associated with the lethargy and the grogginess and tiredness that they experience in the carbohydrate cravings to try to get out of that. <clears throat> and we gave them 20 hertz, and it was a highly effective study. And their carbohydrate cravings went way down, and they lost a, a significant amount of weight. <clears throat> 